Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Bible Illustrated Hands. Hands. Uh, I wish you all a very blessed beginning of Great Lent in Orthodox Christianity and simply Lent in Catholic Christianity or whatever form of Lent your particular church or denomination or what have you might follow. Um, I received a question which was rel relatively snide and it will receive an answer. That is why I won't list the name of the person who gave it because, eh, you know, people. <laughs> okay, so the question is, uh, where, where, well, a comment on one of my videos was, hmm, so the Orthodox do pray to the saints. Hmm, remind me where does the Bible teach us to pray to the saints? Okay, you know, uh, first of all, that is a very loaded question. It is a federal loaded question because it implies that the Bible is the ultimate authority when it comes to faith and morals, which is sola scriptura, which again means that it is based on Protestant Reformation, i.e. no one believed that for 1500 years, like no one, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, and I would like to point out an interesting fact all of the churches that can trace their existence to the Apostles, Eastern Orthodox Church, Roman Catholic Church, um, Oriental Orthodox Churches, uh, Indian Christians, you know, they all practice veneration and prayer to the saints. But <laughs> if your denomination was founded by a defrocked monk or priest or what have you, some 500 or less years ago, Curiously, it does not practice this August and ancient custom, you know, uh, something to ponder about. Okay, so, so now that we have agreed, <laughs> even though I would assume that a lot of you haven't, that Bible isn't really the ultimate, uh, you know, guideline uh, to faith and morals, because uh, there are some strange things in the Bible, like um, St. Paul, the Apostle, giving... Uh, instructions as regards to his personal effects to people he wrote letters to, you know, strange thing to include uh, in, um, you know, a document that's finite. Now, Bible is great and all. However, uh, the holy tradition of the Orthodox Church is a continuation of the Bible, you know. The Bible does not end at the last page of the Revelation. Christianity moves on, you know, it marches on. <laughs> and uh, the entire history of the church is the continuation of that same Bible. So, uh, but uh, in order to, you know, uh, stay true to your limitations, where does the Bible teach to pray to the saints? Uh, it does not teach it directly, but it can be very easily inferred from the Bible itself. Now, uh, first of all, Bible does teach that we must pray for other people, you know, uh, for example, in uh, the Epistle to James, chapter 5, uh, verse 16, pray for one another and confess to one another. And to Epistle to Colossians, uh, chapter 4, verse 3, again, uh, pray for one another. And this is clear because, one, it is expression of our love for our fellow man, and second, prayer does uh, prayer does affect tangible effect on reality. However, uh, the more important uh, uh, verses as regards to intercession of saints, um, that, uh, that is because, um, you know, apostles themselves sought prayers of others. Uh, I made a mistake previously, Col uh, Colossians uh, chapter uh, 4 verse 3, it says, pray for us. It also says like that in uh, Hebrews 12. Again, pray for us. Now, why is this strange? Because a typical Protestant argument against the intercession of saints is, well, why don't you go to Jesus directly? Uh, in practice, Protestants don't believe this because they will often, very often, ask for prayers from other people. And that is perfectly fine because... Uh, intuitive, intuitive, 
you know that it makes a difference when there is a single person praying for you and then where there is the multitude praying for you. And as Christ says, where there are two or three uh, disciples gathering in my name, I'm there with them. So that is why we seek prayers from other people, because Christianity in its essence is a communal religion, a, a religion of community. Uh, it is a kingdom, not a cubicle. Um, we say our father, not my father, and so on and so forth. And uh, when we gather for the Eucharist, we gather to do it together. We don't do private Masses. So, uh, there is a reason why the Apostle asks for prayers of the fathers. The why don't you go to Jesus directly isn't what it's all about, because that saint will again go to Jesus directly. Uh, and uh, again, I'm simply involving prayers of my brothers and sisters in Christ to pray with me, like St. George over here, you know. Uh, the man literally suffered, suffered grievous torments. He was literally loyal unto death to Christ, you know. Uh, prayers of a righteous man availeth much, as says the Epistle of James, and therefore I do trust more into his prayers than those of my own, because, again, uh, he was buried in a lime pit, uh, they tortured him on a wheel, in the end uh, they cut off his head, and he simply needed to bow down to the Roman gods, and he didn't. Uh, will I show that amount of preservance if I were into such a situation? I do not know. I hope and pray that I do, but it is uncertain, you know. Uh, I can still be fickle and, you know, um, it's uncertain. For George, it is certain, and again, he has proved uh, his intercessions many times over. Now, uh, what Protestants here will generally say? Well, that's necromancy. Uh, okay, first of all, do you know what necromancy is? I made a video called uh, Of Saints and Necromancers that addresses this issue. Necromancy is an occult discipline where we try to summon a spirit of a dead person in order to divine the future. That is not <laughs> why we go and pray to the saints, <laughs> you know. Uh, while I, like many other people, would like to know to the future, uh, the Lord saw it prudent that majority of us actually do not know nor cannot know the future. And that is not why I go uh, to pray to a saint. Again, I go to him in order to seek his intercession before the throne of Christ. Also, uh, when Elijah and Moses appeared to Christ on Mount Tabor when he transfigured before his disciples, was Saint Peter, the apostle, practicing necromancy when he addressed Christ and, you know, talked about Elijah and Moses, especially Moses because Moses was definitely dead at the time. Um, Elijah has ascended into heaven and you can make an argument that he's a live person. However, was was uh, was him speaking to Moses an act of necromancy? Again, it wasn't. It simply wasn't. Because saints are alive in Christ. That is why we pray to them. We don't pray to just about any person. Um, if we seek intercession uh, from someone, at the very least, these people need to be baptized and members of the church. That is uh, why we do not seek intercession from departed non-Christians. Um, now, uh, Christ was, you know, criticized over the same thing uh, because, uh, uh, because when uh, he says that he knows personally Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, um, uh, the Sadducees who denied the resurrection, uh, the existence of souls, uh, and so on, uh, I, uh, accused him that, um, you know, He's, uh, <laughs> he's young, and so on. However, Christ replies that, uh, that God is not God of the dead. He's the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and he adds, uh, very importantly, you are very much mistaken. Uh, Christ does use strict language. Uh, he generally does not seek out people against whom to use it. But, you know... Uh, Sadducees, as we say in Serbian, simply give him a gun, loaded gun, into his hands. You know, uh, it's very interesting that he says that. 
we believe again that saints are alive in Christ and that is why it is important um, that we pray specifically to them and not just about to anyone else. Uh, the same goes for angels. Uh, angels are shown in the Bible to carry our prayers uh, before the Lord. Again, you can, uh, you can simply make the argument, well, don't they go to Jesus directly? Doesn't Jesus know uh, what we pray to him about? Of course he does, but again, it's about the community. You know, again, in the Revelation um, chapter, uh, I need to check my notes, sorry. Uh, in chapter 8, uh, we have uh, uh, the angel incensing, uh, offering incense at the altar. And that incense is the prayers of the saints, you know, in the colloquial sense of all Christians, not specifically uh, the meaning we would use today in the Orthodox Church, meaning canonized saints. Um, and in the book of Tobit, uh, it says in chapter 12, uh, Archangel Raphael says that um, whenever, uh, uh, whenever Tobias would cry his heart, uh, heart out and do alms and bury the dead, he was there to present his prayers to the Lord. And you might say, well, that book isn't in my Bible, where well, it should be because it was in the Bible for 1500 years. Uh, if your Bible does not have this book, it means it is a faulty Bible that lacks a book that all Christians considered scripture. Something else to ponder. Um, now, uh, one might say, well, where is this specifically stated in the Bible and why, why isn't it emphasized? Again, right, generally uh, writers of the Bible didn't know that what they're writing would be included in this huge corpus um, that we would use for reference of how the entire Christian world should live. Of course, we believe that the scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit and that through his, uh, you know, grace, the Spirit assembled this scripture. The very people who assembled the scripture believed in the intercession of saints. And of course, they wouldn't put anything in the Bible in, in, in the sense of like tampering with, tampering with it. However, why isn't it more specifically emphasized? First of all, we have the Old Testament. Now, uh, the Old Testament really isn't big on afterlife. You would be very uh, uh, hard-pressed to find any references to afterlife whatsoever uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament. There are some, however, when you compare it to its volume, what it means and so on, those references are very few and far between. Uh, in fact, you, one can easily make the argument that there are even more verses that claim that man is literally no different than a beast, that when uh, it dies, you're gone forever. <laughs> this especially goes for Gentiles, you know. <laughs> Jews might have a chance of some sort of eternal life, but Gentiles, I don't know if they're even referenced in that regard. Uh, however, there is a reason for this. Um, in Orthodox in Orthodox eschatology, that is the teaching on the end times, uh, we believe that that before Christ ended up in Hades, that is Sheol, the abode of the dead. When Christ came and died on the cross, he entered Hades, liberate, liberated the spirits who were imprisoned therein, and he brought them into the bosom of Abraham. When Christ talks about uh, the rich man and Lazarus, uh, that is probably, probably the strongest affirmation of some sort of post-death, pre-resurrection, afterlife ever in the Bible. Again, there are some. However, that one's most direct. And I know that some people will say, that's a parable. It's not. Uh, it, uh, it teaches mor uh, mo uh, morals, that's true. But it is indicative that... Uh, uh, the poor man has a name and he teaches, he teaches theology. Uh, there is not really a whole room left for symbol. <laughs> you know, it's not uh, a typical parable. So, uh, the Old Testament does not teach the prayer of the saints because, again, saints are simply uh, <laughs> imprisoned in Hades. And considering the issues that, uh, that 
ancient Jews had with idolatry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can uh, easily see why it was uh, why it would have been problem even if <laughs> uh, even if those all of those saints were in Abraham's bosom. Now, uh, in the New Testament, the situation is not really all that different because again, we mostly see uh, from the vantage point of Jews uh, who uh, who have recently converted to Christianity and. Uh, the communion of saints is something that grows over time for a very, uh, for a very logical reason, because Christians had more opportunity to experience the intercession of saints, because as Christianity was persecuted, uh, Christians would uh, bury persecuted Christians generally to much scandal by local pagans, because a lot of them consider dead bodies impure, especially of executed criminals. And you can imagine how it would seem to an, I know, ancient Greek, ancient Egyptian, that somebody who was uh, hanged or skinned alive for blasphemy uh, was actually, uh, wasn't left to rot, but was taken by his fellows and buried with all honor. Out of that veneration of Saint starts to be born because Christians start noticing that there's a lot of miracles going on around these bodies, you know, and combine that, that they pray for the dead, they pray for their, their repose, uh, combine that with a lot of visions of these saints coming to aid to Christians, um, uh, uh, foretelling, you know, uh, uh, foretelling what is come to pass and that it coming to pass. Um, miraculous healings, exorcisms, and so on and so forth, people started to realize these people are alive. And they're not just alive, they're more alive than we are. So uh, thank you for your slight question. I hope I answered your inquiry. Bye!